everybody. Welcome to another episode of Lightspeed with Richard and Ilya, the founders of Tensor. Guys, welcome to the show. Hey, good to be here. Thanks for having us. Yeah, glad to have you. I want to talk about how NFTs are becoming the next trillion dollar asset class and how we're going to get there. And I think to get the audience prepared for that, let's start with a high level overview of what Tensor is and how a team of two devs took on Magic Eden, which has a firm of over 120 employees. So Richard, maybe if you want to start, I think that'd be great just to give a high level overview. Yeah, I guess I could start from the beginning. So uh, just briefly, I know, I know I've mentioned this on other pods, but Ilya and, I, Ilya and I met back in March 2022. We kicked it off by trying to look for a co-founder to work together on a cool project. Long story short, we initially worked on an NFT pricing oracle. We found that there was no product market fit there. No one wanted to buy it. Uh, so we pivoted to building an NFT trading platform. I think what we initially underestimated was how competitive this space was. We obviously knew Magic Eden was the big player in the space. We obviously knew there were a couple of other players that were still pretty big at the time, like Hyperspace, like Coral Cube, and they were doing cool things with NFTs. I think for us, we saw that there was an opportunity to appeal to the prosumer audience. We call them the pros, but realistically, like there are no pros in the NFT space. Like we're all just a bunch of DGens trying to flip NFTs and JPEGs for profit. Uh, so really, we're, we were targeting the prosumer segment that was heavily underserved by existing platforms. And we wanted to build a truly revolutionary experience when it comes to trading NFTs in bulk and size on a very simple to use uh, UI that almost looks like a Binance or a, a Bybit, almost like a centralized exchange terminal experience. And so that's when we started working on this pro NFT trading platform. Uh, we also went into an accelerator called Alliance. They helped us a bunch when it came to strategy, when it came to marketing. And long story short, we basically followed a similar playbook to Blur, which is obviously the, the big success on Ethereum, who overtook OpenSea, which is obviously a very big company on Ethereum. And, you know, since then, we've sort of uh, developed our own personality and uh, we're trying to pave our own way on Solana. Yeah, that's a great intro. How does the so how does the NFT trading actually work? So I think when Tensor first went live to Bootstrap, you started with an aggregator. Is that right? And then what are some of the products that you offer today? Because I know you want to get to the point where it's like a true order book, but that maybe doesn't exist yet. So what how what does the offering look like right now? Yeah, it's a mixed bag of things. So the the product that we shipped right after the aggregator was the AMM. And for anybody who doesn't know, AMM st stands for Automated Market Maker. It's just a fancy way of saying, hey, if I give you a bunch of soul or I give you a bunch of NFTs, can you just run the trading strategy for me? So you either sell on a curve or you buy on a curve, or there's a third thing you can do, which is called market making, where you both buy and sell on a curve. And that was interesting because it was novel. It unlocked new trading behavior that you couldn't do with traditional NFT marketplaces. But what we also learned over time was that there's a, there's a tool for each job. And yes, for some of the more advanced guys, these AMMs were good. But for you know normal retail traders who might have one or two NFTs, they were, they were overkill. It was too much. And so over time, we added features that are more similar to the trading you see on traditional marketplaces like OpenSea, like Magic Eden, and just kind of traditional buy and list and sell. And so today, like we have three different contracts at Bar Tensor, one for bidding, one the AMM and normal listings. And then we have a third one, completely separate one for compressed NFTs. This is just a long winded way of saying that guys, ultimately the only thing that matters is the UX for the user. The user doesn't give a shit what delivers it. You need to build whatever you have to build as a developer and then hide it away behind a beautiful UI and just make it work for the user. Um, but yeah, that's what we have today. So, I mean, obviously you think very deeply about product and the user experience. One other thing that maybe some, some writers doesn't know is you guys both have finance backgrounds. So Richard uh, did some quant work, so did you, Ilmo, uh, Ilya. And so I guess I'm curious, you guys could have went to DeFi, you could have went into something else. Why did you choose to build for NFTs? I think at the time we felt that DeFi was pretty crowded. Obviously, like we knew a lot about 
finance. Uh, Ilya was an investment banker. I was doing quant research on sort of the tr traditional financial markets. And so we had the one, I guess, the, the knowledge and two, the skill set to actually build something interesting in DeFi. But I think at the time, we just felt it was a bit too crowded and there was not a lot of like greenfield for us, at least to work on. Um, that's when we sort of like looked towards NFTs and we saw that the financialization of NFTs was heavily unexplored, both on Ethereum and on Solana. This was before the time of PseudoSwap. This was before the time of Blur, before the time of Tensor. There was practically no interesting financial primitives that were being built for NFTs that were similar to what was happening in DeFi. And we saw that as an opportunity, as almost like low-hanging fruit for us to tackle. Uh, the second thing is like we, we found that NFTs were like pretty fun to uh, play around with. And the community was like, the community represents Twitter. If you go on like crypto Twitter, like one in like two people will have a P uh, NFT PFP profile. And we thought that was pretty cool because NFTs are almost like a representation of the crypto culture. It's where people convene socially and rally behind um, when it comes to like the crypto community. And we wanted to build something in that space. I don't, I don't know if Ilya had a different view at the time, but maybe you can comment on that. Yeah, I think it's pretty much that. It was just a newer asset class. Fewer things were done. Like, we started building right at the tail end of the previous bull market. Um, and guys, there were a lot of really smart DeFi teams at the time trying really interesting things. And we just kind of didn't feel that we had an edge where we were like stepping into a sandbox where there were guys who were thinking about this for years. With NFTs, it felt more nascent. Um, it felt more like, okay, there's fewer teams. The teams that exist are less technical. Some of the concepts that they're trying are also less technical. Like we basically had, I, I think that the initial um, hunch that got us excited about building Tensor into what it became today was this idea that most people saw NFTs as kind of this eBay-esque experience of shopping. And we saw it more from the trading perspective. And there weren't many people at the time who shared that vision. And we thought that, okay, that's a different way of looking at it, which means that we can build a more interesting product. And whenever you're a founder, you're basically looking for these moments of like, where do you see the world differently to other people? Like I think Paul Graham or somebody said, like you basically need two things. You need to see the world differently and you need to be right. Obviously now the second one was a lot harder, but you know, you don't try, you don't know. Well, I mean, one thing that comes to my mind then is, so you you guys were exploring, so you thought DeFi was too crowded and you thought there was greenfield NFTs and it was an unexplored space in a sophisticated way. Like nobody had explored it deeply. So I guess then the question is why pick Solana over something else? Like what, what why start your journey on Solana? I think for us, when we thought about how we enable trading behavior for nfts or building the perfect trading experience for nfts we didn't consider ethereum because frankly like if you're trying to trade nfts back and forth in a lot of quantity in with many transactions and at the time this this was still during the bull run of ethereum where gas fees for transferring an nft minting an nft was 20 30 40 dollars plus we just didn't see that as something sustainable that someone could feasibly trade NFTs back and forth with that sort of fixed cost of gas and be profitable at the very end. What we what we envisioned like with NFT trading was that people could trade these NFTs back and forth without having to worry about essentially a, a fixed cost that could amount to you know, 10, 100 basis points, even 1,000 basis points for certain NFTs. Like that was just not sustainable long-term. Um, and, and frankly, like in hindsight, it makes a lot of sense. There is this liquidity effect on Ethereum where people still trade on Ethereum because that's where all the money is. That's where all of these high priced NFTs are. But we're still pretty bullish that Solana and the low gas fees, well, not gas fees, but like low transaction fees, transactions confirming in less than a second. We think that is what the trading experience for NFTs should be uh, long term. I saw you tweet and you said that you started doing the funding round for Tensor basically on the day that FTX collapsed, if, if not the exact day. I think over those next three months, you had over 15 VCs. 
give you no because they said like you need to leave Solana. Like, why are you still building on Solana? So I know you obviously chose Solana and you almost just described why. But what else? What else were you looking at? Because you had a specific product in mind where you wanted to target professional traders, but you also wanted to have great UX UI, which required latency as well. So was there any other chain that you guys looked at um, for Tensor at that time? The short answer is no, because no other chain had even resemblance of a NFT community. Like ultimately as a founder, you need interesting tech to work with, but probably more importantly, you need real users that care about the community they're in. And let's be real guys, like at this point it's too it's Ethereum guys and like all the Ethereum like nearby communities by which I mean the L2s and it's Solana. Mm -hmm. Everything else is, I mean, I'm not saying it's not going to be huge in the future for all I know it might be, but as of right this moment, there's nothing there. It's all like builders building for future users that are going to come at some point. And at least we felt that we were better positioned to build an app that serves real users than a piece of infrastructure that serves developers that one day build an app for users. And so that was kind of a hard constraint for us. Not that we wrote it somewhere on the whiteboard and we said like, this is why. This is just like intuition. It's kind of what's mm -hmm. telling us that that's where we should look. And I guess to to answer your, your question a bit more deeply about like why Solana it's interesting because yesterday I was on, on, on an ETH space and somebody asked us like, hey, why do you guys think AMM pools took off on Solana and they never took off on Ethereum? Or like, wh why does Tensor have so many, uh, has an AMM pool that's so popular? And it was so obvious to me. It was like, because it's, it's cheap. Like it's so cheap to send these transactions on chain. So people do a lot more of it. So they trade back and forth a lot more. And so what we saw in Solana and what we continue seeing to this day yeah, it's just a different design space that's completely unexplored with existing products on ETH. You know, I keep saying this, it's not better, it's not worse, it's just different. And like the product that's gonna be built on this chain are different. And we have a very clear thesis for what you can build on Solana that you can't build on other chains and for why it matters. And I know we'll get into that with like compressed NFTs and whatnot, but ultimately for us, we want to build a company that serves millions and hopefully ideally billions of users one day. And we think Solana, frankly, is one of the only chains as of today where you can do that. What do you think about path dependency? Because you saw a beachhead with professional traders in Solana uh, and using that speed. But you have somebody like Magic Eden who's starting probably more retail focused. And then they're making their way to professional traders. Do you think you have an advantage um, starting where you are with professional traders and I believe there's almost a convergence probably of Tensor and Magic Eden and other competitors who are, you're starting a professional, they're starting a retail, and it's almost a convergence where you're getting closer to also catering to retail as well. I'm curious how you think about that. And as a retail user, like why should I pick Tensor today? Or is it not there yet? That's a great question. I think there are parallels for what happened in the centralized ex exchange space. So if you think about like Coinbase, they definitely went from a more retail approach and then slowly built... Uh, towards pros with their Coinbase Pro, which they later merged into sort of the, the regular Coinbase app. But then they also had Coinbase Institutions, which was clearly targeted towards the pros. And then you had FTX on the other side. It, obviously, FTX had a lot of other issues with it, but they catered to the pros first and then went down to retail, buying out stadiums, putting their brand essentially everywhere that retail people would see. I don't think there's like necessarily a... I don't think one or the other is necessarily better. I think it's, like like you said, it's very path dependent. Magic Eden just saw that clearly there were a lot of retail people who wanted to trade NFTs. We came in after them. And in order for us to differentiate it against Magic Eden and what, I mean, frankly, a, a pretty great product they had at the time, we needed to target an underserved user segment. And that happened to be the pros. And this usually happens in a lot of, a lot of these industries. So... I think to your point, to your question about why would a retail person use Tensor nowadays, I don't think we have like a thing to show a retail user like why you should choose Tensor over Magic Eden. Besides trying to sell them like super hard and essentially trying to buy their favor and like essentially trying to buy them to use Tensor. I think that'll come with us creating differentiated products and features. So one of the things that we're, we're trying to do right now and and trying to push hard on, and I think Mert knows this, is compressed NFTs. We think that compressed NFTs are the vehicle for onboarding the next million users into crypto and into digital assets. 
And the one way that we get more retail users is to build something that no one else has, which is support for these compressed NFTs. First, when it comes to trading, and secondly, of course, creating them, managing them, and everything you can imagine you would want to do with digital assets. So really, like, I, I, I can't give you a straight answer for why retail might use Tensor over Magic Eden right now. I think it'll just come based on the stuff that we build that's differentiated that will attract new users to our platform. Following your story chronologically here, so you were exploring design spaces and you essentially doubled down on NFTs, NFT finance on Solana. And so now you are essentially two pretty hungry devs and you, you choose to build this new platform. But then, you know, the, the elephant in the room is Magic Eden, right? So now you have this massive competitor who has, I think at that point, they had raised a Series A and they have a lot of funding and a lot of mind share and market share as well. How did you, like maybe a meta question is, how did you think about that as two founders? Like how did you approach competition? How are your thoughts on this have evolved over time? Yeah, it's probably another one of those questions where there's no single answer. Like how do you win against another competitor? Well, I mean, where do you start and stop, right? <laughs> there's like a million things that matter from the quality of people you hire to who your investor is and how good of advice they give you. and ultimately like how good is your hunch for the product because at the end of the day all of these are bets like them us the next guy we're all making bets about the future we're saying like we think the market is going to go this direction we think the market is going to go that direction and depending on how successful or unsuccessful those bets are is basically like whether you come up on top or or not but i guess maybe to touch on a few things that we think matter so you mentioned how like Magic Eden, our biggest competitors, obviously super well capitalized, a large team. We don't necessarily think that's a good thing. Um, having a lot of capital can make you lazy. And right now the market is such that it's actually not obvious how you deploy that amount of capital. The other thing that it does is it creates a very layered Web2 style corporate structure with seven layers of management between you and the decision maker. By you, I mean the dev. And so the dev that is actually working with the product or is actually talking to people in Discord who has intuition for what needs to happen can't action it because he needs to go all the way up and ask like, hey, is this part of our roadmap? That's part of a roadmap. That's part of a quarterly report. Well, for us, I mean, we just turn it on a dime. Like we just show up at the office. You know, we're actually three devs now, not two devs. Um, and we're still hiring in case anybody is uh, interested. So, you know, we show up in the office, we look each other in the eye, we just say, like, does this still make sense? And if it doesn't, we just throw it away and we move on to the next thing that does make sense. And we think that in crypto, given how quickly this industry is changing, those kind of nimble small teams are the teams that are going to win because you can just make decisions a lot faster. You can iterate, you can make mistakes and you can be onto your next thing when your competitor is still worried about, you know, the, the thing that you, you basically abandoned three, three years ago. So that's maybe one thing. Um, another thing is I would say I can't comment on Magic Eater or anybody else's obsession with the product because I don't know, but I can comment on ours. And I think it's pretty much, you know, as, as obsessive as it gets. I, I mean, all of us double as customer support agents, partially because we have to, partially because we love to. Like I, I go into Discord and I want to hear what users have to say. And I, like as soon as I see feedback that, I know it's going to take me 10 minutes to implement and just go and do it like straight away. Cause I don't want the user to have to wait for like, you know, seven layers of people to approve it. And then somebody to say like, okay, yes, this can be built. And so I think again, going back to speed, going back to agility, that kind of gives us an edge, but like ultimately I think time will show and it'll really be a battle of placing the right bets and putting the right conviction behind them. We'll get away from Magic Eden and some of the comparisons, but I think it's good to frame it. As in January 2022, Magic Eden had 98% of the market share. And right now, you're sitting at like 47%. So it's been a big change. But that really all started, um, what was this, back in February, or no, March 2023, uh, I think you had about 2% of total market share at that time. And then you launched your first... Um, loot box program, kind of like an airdrop, where based on it's, it's very similar to what Blur did. Um, it's loyalty points, and based off that, I think you can win some NFTs, etc. Um, but you just saw an, a ginormous, like exponential rise in the number of users and volume. I'm curious, like as a crypto developer, how do your systems handle that? Like I've seen you. I think Ilya, you talked about 90% of the code of the protocol is not actually on chain or the contracts. It's like data pipelines, it's the front end. How does that happen? How can you scale like that? I think like 
just just to be like very um, objective here, I don't think the volume and the amount of traffic we're getting is even comparable to what a Web2 company that is serving hundreds of thousands, if not millions, if not billions of users is handling right now. I think like the the amount of technical demand or I guess stress that we're experiencing is probably like equivalent to like an average consumer app in Web2, which is good for us because we're, I mean, me and Ilya, I, at least for me, I, I don't have experience writing an app that scales to a million, like a consumer app that scales to a million users. Like my background is quant models and machine learning models that predicts stock returns. Um, so for me, this was all entirely new, but the benefit is like, we're both very hungry. We like to learn, we like to try new things. We're very principled in the way that we approach, uh, like, like building a new product, building a new, building on a new framework. And I think that's what you need to succeed, especially as a dev, is to just be able to learn quickly and be able to iterate on what you've done so far and just continue building and building better better pipelines, a better product, a faster UI, uh, a better architecture. I think this would be a good time to transition to compressed NFTs. Um, Richard, I've seen you tweet that it would make sense for every NFT uh, in crypto to be a compressed NFT. And Ilya, you then later go on to say that everywhere in the like in your everyday life, you're going to be dealing with NFTs all the time. So essentially, compressed NFTs are going to be everywhere. I think the average person has no idea what a compressed NFT is. So I think maybe let's step back and give an idea of what that is, if you can explain it to the audience. And then we'll get into what the compressed NFTs can actually enable. Yeah, so the simplest way to explain compressed NFTs is just this thing that Merth can ch charge us for and feel okay <laughs> about it. <laughs> but it all seriousness sure. though. So uh, we are using Helios and they've been great. Uh, but yeah, to, to go back to the definition. So compressed NFTs, simple definition, it's the cheapest possible way in crypto to create an NFT. So cheap, in fact, that I think a billion NFTs, I think it's about $10,000 to, to mint, which is like nothing. And that's like a billion. If you, if you scale down to millions, it, it's like a thousand or less. Now, why does that matter? Well, it turns out that a lot of things in life, if you make them cheap enough, you can basically 10x the market size. Great examples of that are car rides, food delivery, things that people thought normally you would maybe do once a week, you know, like you'd get takeout or something. All of a sudden, if it's one tap away and it costs you nothing, you can get it in 30 minutes, people do it a lot more. And all of a sudden it's like a daily thing. And so you 10x the market size, maybe you, you even more the market size. And so we that's our bet with compressed NFTs where the initial meta of NFTs that existed up to today was all about scarcity and getting fewer people involved and getting those people to pay up more. You can think of them as luxury goods. We think that the next meta of NFTs will be the polar opposite of that. It'll be about involving as many people as possible. And in order for you to do that, you have to make these things as cheap as possible. And that's why we're like so hyper bullish on this technology and on Solana, because Solana is, to quote the meme, the only place where it's possible right now. And for us, like when we ask ourselves the question of how do we build a product that caters to a million or to a billion people, then, well, it probably starts with you being able to create an asset that costs you nothing. Because then all of a sudden you enable distribution models such as Drip, where you have hundreds of thousands of subscribers that receive free NFTs and all of a sudden they're engaged and there's a conversation between the creator and the receiver. And there's donations back to the creator. So there's like a myriad of things that open up once you can do that. But yeah, ultimately it all goes back to cost and uh, Solana right now is the only place where you can do that. Yeah, it's compressed NFTs are this very interesting new primitive where before we just thought of NFTs as, you know, PFPs, 10,000 collection supply size, you know, eight pictures that you use on Twitter. But now you can think of them as many different things, right? You can actually use them to model content, which is what Drip, Drip House is doing. Um, and Dialect is doing with sticker packs. You can use them for gaming. So the design space is very, um, it's, it's, it's much more expansive than it was before, where we were actually limited by technology. So... And this, this actually is very interesting for Tensor specifically because you guys are in the intersection of NFTs and finance. And so you're actually able to leverage this and, and you actually have leverage this in practice much faster than other players who do have like a maybe more of a simplistic um, focus. 
And so I guess maybe what, what are some, so you've, you've worked with uh, compressed NFTs for a bit now, and you were actually one of the guinea pigs. Uh, you were one of the first pioneers of it. Um, what are some lessons you've learned? What are some things that you think they enable, like any concrete use cases? Like, what do you wish existed with, with these things? I think with any like new technological shift, it's, it's sort of like a fool's errand to predict long-term, like what these will be used for. Like, I think a great analogy is when the internet and computers came out, right? Who would have thought that we would be using the internet for trading images that are, you know, encoded in, as JPEGs for money back and forth? Like, that's something that no one, not, not even the inventor of the internet could conceive of that, even if he was like the most brilliant guy in the world. Um, that being said, like, I think we have some hunches on where this stuff, um, what's, what this stuff will enable. I think very, like, something that is definitely going to happen is that these will be used um, without thought in every single crypto consumer app at some point. So if you want to give someone a digital thing that they can actually own and that they have possession of, it's going to be a compressed NFT, or it's going to be some NFT that's really cheap to create. It wouldn't make sense to give them a regular NFT because because the app does can't essentially pay you know tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of dollars to give every single person a digital asset that could have basically be worthless. But this basically unlocks these consumer apps to experiment without having to think about sort of the cost of goods that they're paying up for for creating these assets. That basically opens up like distribution models, like what Ilya mentioned with Drip, uh, with Dialect. Dialect are basically doing chat stickers with compressed NFTs. So if you think about like Telegram or any chat app that you, that you use, you send these stickers around and they're kind of like, they're kind of just whatever, right? Like you don't actually own these stickers, they're available to everyone. But now what Dialect has done is basically allow people to collect these stickers and make them things that you own, but it's digital, but it's still worth something because there's a limited quantity and you can trade them back and forth. So if you think about like any consumer app in Web2 that's remotely useful, that has some notion of um, like some something that you could perhaps own, something that you could perhaps collect and show off. I think all of these will eventually use NFTs. And I think it only makes sense for them to use compressed NFTs because of the cost. What are the trade-offs of compressed NFTs? Because when you see it on Twitter, it's like everything sounds amazing and it's it's like Solana, one of Solana's new narrative. But like, why don't you see other blockchains talking about this? Do you, not to get too wonky, but do you have some more trust assumptions? I would assume like you don't, you maybe don't have everything on chain or like, oh yeah, what, what are the trade-offs? In terms of trust, there aren't any trade-offs because the way these things are built without getting too technical here is that you store something on chain that even though this thing, which in this case is the, the proof, isn't itself or the root, I guess, isn't itself the NFT. It 100% it guarantees that the NFT is there and it belongs to you and it has exactly the metadata you think it has. So trust is, is not traded off. But what is traded off is complexity and developer experience. And uh, I'm looking at Mert here because we're in his DMs pretty much daily discovering new problems. Uh, and it really requires a very close cooperation between the RPC provider, in this case Helios, and the app uh, maker, in this case Denser, be like constantly going back and forth and resolving issues because this technology sort of spans the infrastructure stack as much as it spans the app stack. And you really need these two teams working in tandem. And so, you know, when it comes to a solo developer that just wants to spin up a fun little app for a hackathon, this is going to be a lot harder to do than it would be to do with normal NFTs. So I think the biggest trade-off is probably that. I don't know, Richard, can you think of anything else? Yeah, that's a great point. Like developer experience, it's going to get there. Like Mert, the guys at Helios are building awesome tools, like basically a one one API endpoint to get all the information about compressed NFTs. So that's great. I think the other thing is that, I mean, one thing that we're starting to see happen with compressed NFTs is because they're so cheap to make, like people don't even think about like how much it costs to send someone one of these compressed NFTs or to create a thousand compressed NFTs. I think spam is going to be a very real issue. People will be getting thousands, tens of thousands of these compressed NFTs. It's going to make the jobs of 
wallet providers, of RPC providers, of us, like a marketplace, indexing all of this data and surfacing them to, to the user like efficient efficiently enough, and also like trying to hide the spam, that's going to be very difficult, or it's going to take some time, some thought into thinking about how we handle this stuff. I, I think like, you know, it, it, it's part of the, it's part of the, um, part of the benefit of having really cheap stuff. Um, like we're going to get a lot more data. We're going to get a lot more compute coming into our infrastructure that we just have to, you know, handle that we have to think about, but it's all like engineering technical problems, right? That's a really good point on the developer complexity. I think that's maybe even a more Solana specific trade-off that you make, which is you you get a lot of performance, but you now have to understand the accounts very well. You have to understand the program model of Solana very well. And um, one thing I'll also comment on, just I, I can't help myself, I'll burst, uh, is that you, you couldn't actually have something like compression on Ethereum or really any other album I'm aware of because the compute to storage ratio for the costs is not the same. So on Solana, compute is very cheap, but storage is very expensive and compression just solves that directly. Whereas on Ethereum, so actually the only comparable thing right now is Lens has like an L3 called Bonsai, I believe. And that's the only thing that comes close to this, but obviously you need an L3 to come close. Um, and so I'll stop that there. Uh, not going to make it a monologue about <laughs> the L1 wars. Um, one thing that's interesting well, to me. Oh, go ahead. I quickly comment on that. I will say that if you were if you were to play the devil's advocate to that uh, argument, you could say that an Ethereum guy would say, "Okay, well, hold on. Uh, our the way we do com the, the way we do NFTs on Ethereum is way more efficient because we don't need to mint the token for every single NFT. So it's kind of like we did compression before you guys did compression, but you called it like a cool name, and now it's you know, now it's like a whole thing on Solana. It doesn't scale to the same numbers as the Solana compression uh, does. So you can't mint a billion for a thousand bucks, but it's somewhere in the middle. And, you know, a lot of people could argue that maybe that middle is actually kind of optimal because you you can do like a single uh, long object with a hundred thousand NFTs in it. And it all fits into a single contract and that's it. And you don't have all this headache that we have on Solana with like tokens and accounts and all of that connecting all of it and paying rent and yeah just mm -hmm. i think that's an interesting counter argument in ethereum the, the way nfts work is kind of interesting because they're actually tied to the smart contract itself as opposed to um you know being their own collection that inherit from the token program or something uh and that what, what that has done and this is something that isn't really talked about that much in the industry is open c has this api that you need to get listing prices for these nfts at least in the old version. I'm not sure if the new uh, Seaport stuff has fixed that. And I think it has. But there, there's been a very long period of time where actually working with NF and actually like Twitter's um, the the Hexagon PFP integration actually uses OpenSea's APIs. And so there was actually this very um, semi-centralized or let's say custodial thing that you need to do that you had to use OpenSea APIs to get to work with NFTs. Whereas on Solana, you, you also have your centralization problems like Metaplex having control of the program. But it's not as if like one of these things is much better than the other. It's like all these ecosystems just kind of suck and we need to just do our best to make them suck less. Um, so that's just something I just I just want to, um, I, I feel like it doesn't get brought up enough. Yeah, a, a comment on that. I think this will be very controversial and very perhaps a bit provocative, but I don't think anyone cares about centralization when it comes to NFTs. I think people are totally fine if they're bored ape, if they're... D gods, if they're mad lads, if they're clanos, has a ton of centralization around it. As long as they can still trade them back and forth, as long as they, as long as they can still rep them on their uh, Twitter profile picture, and as long as enough people believe that these things have value, and that social consensus that these things have value, despite all of these centralization um, aspects of it, I think that's what. Like frankly, that that's what people care about. It would be nice to have decentralized NFTs or like fully like a hundred percent decentralized NFTs, but I don't think that's a world where we'll get to. Like as as optimistic as I am. Where, where's the metadata uh, for these compressed NFTs? Is that is that with the RPC provider? Is it with Arweave? Wherever you want is the shorter answer. You, want. you can you can choose where you want to have it. Some people will want to have it more decentralized. Other people want to have it more centralized. I will say that 
I think this space has obviously a obsession with decentralization and like that's a good thing because otherwise the space wouldn't exist. But I will also say that I think the history here is very telling that there's actually only one layer of consensus in blockchain, so that's social consensus. And for anybody who thinks Solana is decentralized and thinks that this argument doesn't apply to ETH, I want you, I want, I want you to remember the DAO hack when Ethereum just came together and said, okay, actually, no, this is not correct. And just like threw away a bunch of guys, someone, someone's money and just said like, no, actually, this is the correct fork, right? And like, where's ETH Classic today? Ultimately, all of this is social technology and it goes back to people. And I think what we're trying to build here is not a perfect, ideal world where everything is decentralized, but we're trying to build something that is a magnitude improvement over the current system. And that's a very different way of looking at it. It doesn't need to be perfect. It needs to be better. And it needs to be 10x better, but probably not 100x better. Because at that point, your market size of people that you can serve with that technology is tiny. Like not every person in the world is prepared to have seven ledgers, move them between three computers, you know, air gap this and air gap that just so that they, they never lose their money. It's not going to scale, guys. You have to be pragmatic. You have to make trade-offs that are like, okay, yeah, like, Somebody can sell your NFT, and that's important. But maybe your NFT's metadata doesn't live on chain because if it did, then it would crowd the chain and it would become unusable. So I think it's important to think about these things in context. Hey everyone, we'll get back to the show in a minute, but I want to let you know that we've got a permissionless conference coming up. This is our conference with Bankless. That's the biggest and best conference in DeFi. It's going to be in Austin, Texas this year. Yep, I know you love it. They got tacos, barbecue, Barton Springs. They got it all. September 11th through the 13th. If you've been in crypto for a while, you know that the bear market conferences are the best conferences because those are the ones where all the alphas had. The people that are still in crypto all really want to be there. It's going to be great for building a network, for learning a lot. And look, we've got a phenomenal lineup of speakers that include people like Hasu, Stani, Christine Moy, and Kyle Samani. Talking about ZK Tech, rollups, account abstraction, MEV, app chains, and more. Look, I'm damn excited. Because you're a listener of Lightspeed, you're going to get a special discount. Type in discount code Lightspeed30 and you'll get 30% off your ticket. That's right. Just type in Lightspeed30 when buying a permissionless ticket and get 30% off. Click the link at the bottom of this episode and go get it now because prices are going up every two weeks. All right, back to the show. So, I mean, we're already on this topic, so let's just get to it. You guys... At Tensor are also releasing NFTs. I think they're called Tensorians. I've seen some DGENs with tattoos or maybe even haircuts with the logo so far. Uh, I mean, are you guys are you guys crazy? Like, why why are you releasing the NFT? What is uh, what do you think? What is the thought process there? And, and before you for you answer that, I gotta add. I think Richard, you you tweeted just two days ago or three days ago that you're actually bearish PFP NFTs on Solana, and you said that it's not that they're going away. But that's not what's going to 100 times the, I guess, NFT market on Solana. So yeah, why, why are you releasing NFTs when you said you were bearish? Yeah, I think there are two pieces to that. So I guess I'll answer the why we're releasing an NFT project to begin with. And that'll sort of answer part of the second, second uh, question. So one thing that we lack currently uh, on, on Tensor right now is that while we have a really cool platform that tens of thousands of people use every single day that people rave about on Twitter. They say Tensor is awesome this, Tensor is awesome that, it changed the way that I trade NFTs. AMMs are so cool. While we have all of that uh, sort of at our tailwind, one thing that we lack right now is something tangible to actually give to people so that they can say that they're part of Tensor, that, that they're part of the Tensor community, that they're a Tensorian. That, that's sort of our collection name. I think that's really, What's really unique about Web3 is that you can give someone something tangible that is meaningful, that they can use, that they can rep on their Twitter PFP, that they can essentially show off and say that I am a proud user of Tensor and I support their mission in making NFTs scale to the next million users, to the next billion users and become a trillion dollar asset class. And I think that's exactly why we're doing an NFT project. It's not because of the money, because the mint cost will be like dirt cheap. Like it'll be like inconsequential. And in fact, we'll probably lose money based on all of our expenses uh, going into this NFT project. Uh, and it's not about, you know, becoming an NFT project founder. It's really about giving 
building a tangible community that we can uh, f you know, talk to people at conferences, say, hey, do, do you hold a Tensorian? If you do, let's chat. Let's chat about what you're working on. Um, so, so that's the first part. The second part about PFPs, while I said I'm bearish about PFPs on Solana, I wouldn't say I'm bearish about PFPs and, and it going to zero, because I think those are two different, those are quite different. I think PFPs will still be around on Solana for sure. And if Solana grows, PFPs will grow proportionally. But I think the difference here is that Solana isn't the chain for PFPs and collectibles. I think that clearly belongs to Ethereum. And I think a lot of people feel more comfortable having high valued collectibles on Ethereum. I'll and take. as as much as I want that to change and I, as much as I want Solana to become that chain, I don't think it's going to happen just because of the Lindy effect, because of the liquidity effect. I think what is going to happen is Solana will differentiate itself by coming up with a, a new meta of NFTs. We think that's going to be, that's going to evolve compressed NFTs and having cheap enough, almost like vehicles for digital assets that a million users can actually use without the issuer, without the users themselves having to pay, you know, the exorbitant costs of creating an NFT right now. Do you, one thing as a founder myself, or I mean, I guess I LARP is one, um, I always worry about, or the reason why I haven't done it myself is because I worry that it'll take too much time away from building product. Is that a concern you guys have? Like, how, how do you approach that? Because now you have, essentially you have like the rabid fan base of like a public company that thinks they're an owner of the company, which they're not. I mean, they're just a part of the community, which is a completely different thing. Uh, my lawyers helped me with the wording of that. And, but then, but then they still act like it, right? That's been a big deal with NFT communities so far where they think they have like, I don't know, they'll say like, you guys are doing it wrong. You're stuck. And then they'll, they'll create FUD. So that's going to probably open some headaches for you guys. How are you, you know, mentally preparing for that? Uh, how are you going to split your time between product and community? Yeah, I'm going to be the most controversial here because I'm going to disagree with both of you. I'm going to disagree with Richard uh, in that I actually think Solana can become a chain for collectibles and uh, just different collectibles. And I think if Solana as a community does well, there'll be enough people. Basically, the simple equation to understand with collectibles is that when do you buy a collectible? Oh, like, let's start here. What is a collectible? Well, it's a luxury good. Like, really, you don't need it. You buy it because it's it's, it's a status thing. It's it's for you to show off. Now, when do you buy a luxury good? It's when you have an excessive wealth. And so if Solana as a chain does well, there'll be enough people on this chain, DeFi founders, investors, traders, you name it, who made enough money that they will want to put it into something native to the source of their wealth. That's basically why Ethereum NFTs are 10x the floor of Solana NFTs is because people who made their money in Ethereum feel allegiance to Ethereum, they feel loyalty. And so they want to give back to that community by buying NFTs on that chain. So for me, the conclusion that Solana will be a collectibles chain is not at all foregone, but that's my personal view. Um, and by the way, like for anybody listening, we always disagree as founders. And I think that's part of the reason we're a powerful team. Uh, now, on the second point, I also don't think that us releasing an NFT collection will create the issue of people telling us what to do and us not agreeing with that. First of all, I think we're releasing a collection when we already have a product rather than releasing a collection and promising something in the future. And I think that makes all the difference in the world because we're not telling somebody like, oh, guys, you should buy this and then maybe, maybe something in the future. We're telling them like, guys, we're, we've been doing awesome things for the last year. We're going to continue doing awesome things. And if you want to be a little bit closer to us, you want to have faster access to new features. You want to be closer to the founding team. You want to feel special. You want to be, you want to feel like you're part of Tensor. Then you should get one. And that's a totally different pitch because all of a sudden, all of these people that choose to get one, I mean, we want to listen to them because they chose to align with us. They chose to be part of Tensor. So I'm actually not at all worried about what feedback our holders might have. If anything, I want to hear that feedback because that is the feedback that got us to where we are today. And I think that is going to make us 10x stronger going forward. So we talked about compressed NFTs. You talked about your focus on the users. I'm curious about the, the upcoming roadmap for Tensor and like what you're looking to build next. Uh, you've seen Blur with Blend, their perpetual... Uh, lending protocol is that something that you're exploring or like what type of products are you looking into and i think 
Richard, you may have mentioned with compressed NFTs, one thing that it does allow is it almost creates fungibility for NFTs even more than you have today uh, with collections, just because the collection size can be so large. And then that can enable new products itself. So I'd love for you to expand on that and maybe what other venues you're looking into. For us, I think blend, like just lending for NFTs, lending when it comes to not depending on an Oracle, uh, that's sort of like what Blend innovated on compared to existing peer-to-pool models. I think that is something that we're thinking about, but it's probably not top of mind for us right now. I think what's more interesting is sort of the whole compressed NFTs, being able to scale this technology to millions of users. I think that's a lot more exciting for us. I think one thing that we're starting to realize right now is that while we can build really cool things, uh, perhaps creating creating a new lending protocol primitive for NFTs, perhaps creating more sophisticated derivatives for NFTs. While all that is very interesting, we just feel like right now that's not what crypto needs and that's not what the NFT community on Solana needs or, or just any NFT community across any chains. What we need is to find a way to bring more users into the space to actually proliferate NFTs and the idea of digital assets so that you know, you, your uh, relatives, your the friends at, at Thanksgiving dinner will actually be interested in NFTs beyond just like speculation. Mm. I think that's yeah. something that people don't want to talk about much is that a lot of crypto is just speculation right now. And that's while it's while it's keeping, you know, while it's paying for the bills, while it's keeping the wheels turning, it's not something that is exciting in the long term. Like it, it, it's fun for now, but we need to grow beyond just speculation. Yeah, it's like a bootstrapping mechanism that hopefully turns into something um, you'd say maybe has more utility in the long run. I, I think it's interesting. You have, a, you have a large focus on UX and you're for professional traders, but I've also heard you talk about you want to become like the liquidity platform for NFTs that others build on top of. If you got a choice, maybe, maybe explain that further, but if you had a choice, are you looking to become a black platform where users maybe don't even interact with you directly? So they're not going to Tensor.com or your website. Like, would that be your ideal vision or would it be others are building on top of you and they don't even know that you exist? For example, something like Shopify. Yeah. Um, I think the ideal outcome that every entrepreneur wants, every tech founder, is that you build something that other others are building on top of and you just kind of sit back and let it scale to a billion users and you win. But <laughs> I think the unfortunate, yeah, I think the unfortunate reality is that that very rarely happens. Most often what happens is you have to fight tooth and nail to build your own product, your own consumer product, your own brand. And then it might just so happen that once you've built that, you have a platform that others want to use. And I think Uniswap is a great example here where they didn't set out by saying, here's an API, guys, you go build exciting stuff. No, they shipped a consumer product that people liked they continue to iterate on that product and ship new versions of it, building their brand into something people trusted. And then lo and behold, they found developers knocking on their door saying, hey, can we build on top of you? And so if I was to model Tensor on something, I would probably model it on something Uniswap-esque, where the job for us right now is to build a consumer product that people love and can't live without. And if we do that, then everything follows. We briefly kind of thought about the idea of becoming like a pure dev platform or like a liquidity layer. We just think it's a pipe dream right now. I, we don't think you can do that today. Maybe when crypto is like 10x the size it is today, then yeah, but not today. That's a really interesting response. I'm, I'm curious how you think about um, almost owning the user relationship. And you've seen Uniswap. We made, we made that comparison there. They, they've built a wallet, which I think it's way too early to see if that's actually successful. Um, I'm curious if you think that's a route that applications should go towards. Uh, I know you've talked about Armani with XNFTs and Backpack. Is that something that you've played with uh, recently and see as maybe a distribution mechanism? Um, yeah, just how do you think about that uh, user touch point? I think we're starting to realize that owning the user touch points is super important. Not because not because we want to like own the entire stack for the sake of it and just like own like basically try to own the user. But I think it it gives us more opportunities where we were not dependent on, you know, someone who's building on top of us to implement a feature that we know has product, well, maybe not we know has product market fit, but we know has demand. And just like waiting, like depending on upstream 
I guess downstream downstream builders to build the right things for us. So the having that user touch point basically lets us experiment and iterate and move much quicker um, with the user than sort of like disintermediating disintermediating that and having someone else own the user touch point. So I think for us, like we'll always want our own UI for Tensor Tensor the marketplace for as long as we can maintain this UI. But if it happens that someone else builds a much better UI on top of our marketplace and is fast to iterate and is satisfying the users and they're basically making our users very happy and perhaps they don't even know that Tensor is the underlying marketplace, then we're also happy with that outcome. For now, like because there are not a lot of people building consumer-facing apps, we kind of have to own that relationship and be able to iterate quickly on that interface. So shifting gears slightly, we're now getting into maybe a meta discussion of building products and you know scaling to a million users and consumers. You guys are obviously a venture-backed startup. You you raised from Placeholder and, and Chris there. And you, before that, you were actually at Alliance, which is sort of an accelerator. Um, could you, and, and so like that is to say, you are first, you have firsthand experience into building the early stages of a startup and, you know, getting some sort of success and, and hiring people or forming a team. What are some things that you've learned about startups so far that are surprising to you? Okay. Um, maybe I can start. Probably the thing that is super obvious to me now that wasn't obvious back then is how much distribution matters versus product. I think there's this saying that like first time founder thinks about product, second time founder thinks about distribution. And like, I just couldn't agree more because ultimately everything is about whether you can put the thing that you build in front, in front of the right eyes and whether they can get excited. And that equation can be very complicated or it can be very simple. Like if you're coming out of an industry where you work for 10 years, can you put like your next B2B product in front of people in those industry? Probably at one phone call, right? Or on the contrary, if you're like my first startup that I ever attempted was trying to sell software into investment banks, you guys can imagine how that went. Uh, there was no exit. There was no nothing because I couldn't get the meetings. Like nobody would take the meeting with me, right? I was a 20-year-old trying to sell software into investment banks. And so it's all about distribution. Product absolutely matters, but it only matters in as much as you can serve the user the most important, the 80-20, right? The, the most important thing that they need within the distribution channels that you have access to. Anything on top of that, anything over that is kind of nice to have. Like you'd rather have a worse product with a better distribution than the perfect product and no distribution. And I think history is just littered with examples of that. So I think to me, that's probably been the most visceral learning where it like completely changed how I think about the company, uh, company building. Um, I'll throw it over to Richard. Yeah, I think one of the most real revelations that I've had while building a startup while going up against large incumbents that are well capitalized, have hundreds of millions, hundreds of millions of dollars in the bank, is that your advantage as a startup is to be able to navigate what they call sort of this this idea maze um, very quickly and be nimble enough to make a decision on sort of the a flip of a dime. I think that's really important if you want to survive and succeed eventually as a startup, uh, because like. That's that's the only advantage you have against a large incumbent. Like they can out out user acquisition you. They can out um, engin out engineer bandwidth you. They can out hire you by tenfold, a hundredfold. But one thing that they don't have is being able to move quickly and shift the entire company, shift the entire product towards a direction that you as a founder have a really good hunch on. Just because you're grinding it out, you're in. You're in the trenches every single day talking to users. And that is the advantage that you would have over a CEO that is running a 1,000 person company or a 10,000 person company that is so far removed. They have like so many more important things to do, like figuring out finances, figuring out fundraising that you as a startup, frankly, don't need to think about. Um, the, the other part of, to that is that 
it seems like it's very path dependent and that making it's almost like every decision, every significant decision um, can change the course of the startup. And it's all about making better than average decisions along the way so that these decisions accumulate and you get to a really good place. I mean, frankly, like there are competitors in any field and how you compete against someone else who's building the exact same product as you comes down to those key decisions that you make uh, and being able to iterate on those, being able to iterate on the decision and the outcome of them quickly enough so that the competitor isn't um, like, so that, so that you essentially stand up compared to the competitor. I will also add to that, um, that the point about making decisions, I think that's a really important one. As a founder, your job is actually not to make the best decisions. As a founder, your job is to make the best possible decisions under a shit ton of pressure fast because your day is littered with 75,000 things that you need to get done. You'll never get all of them done. And you need to be in the moment deciding like, okay, this is what I allocate my time to. This is what I allocate my time to. Can I outsource this to, to this person? Can I outsource this to that person? And if you can't outsource something because it's too important, then what is the 80-20 that you can do here? Can you just read through the code and leave a bunch of comments? Or do you, is it better for you to sit down and rewrite it? Right? Like, I think what I'm realizing more and more and more is that it's it's never about making the perfect decisions. It's actually way better to make good decisions, but make them fast and then just learn from them and just, just make more good decisions, but make them fast. It's all about speed. Startups are basically a race. Anybody getting into this thinking that, they're going to have the luxury of time. It only gets worse with this each passing day and each extra customer you onboard. And you it's basically a race. You have to be like constantly, constantly, constantly thinking about speed and how much you can get done in a short amount of time. Mm -hmm. So while we're on that topic, Ilya, you know I was going to bring this up. Uh, <laughs> you have a very infamous post on Twitter uh, after you, I believe you interviewed someone and you, you, you talked about their GitHub activity and it, it got some... Um, let's say controversy around it. Um, what do you, what are your thoughts on? Okay. So number one, what are your thoughts on work-life balance? Because I mean, I know I personally don't believe in that concept, but you know, everybody has their different take on it, but two, there's a lot of people in Solana that look up to you two, uh, right? You two guys and what you've been able to accomplish so far, what advice would you give them on, you know, how to, how to get started and, and, you know, amp it up and accelerate and build startups? Yeah, I'd say that, a device on something like this is very situation dependent. Do you have two kids or do you, or are you a uh, single guy in your twenties? I mean, that question alone basically like decides like how you should be thinking about building a company, right? Do you, do you have 10 years of experience in an industry or do you not? And so obviously like, yes. So there is, there was that post where I basically saw somebody who didn't do any commits on the weekends. And I posted and I said, well, I wouldn't hire this guy. And what I was getting at there, I said, if somebody is telling me that they're a passionate engineer, they love what they do, but in two years, they haven't done a single commit on a weekend, can I really trust that they're passionate? Because for me, it's hard to believe that somebody who's genuinely into their craft doesn't touch their craft on the only uh, slot in the week when they have free time. I just, I just cannot believe in that. To me, that's just a signal that they don't, they don't care, right? Like for them, it's a job and, and they'll just close their computer and they'll go home. Now, of course, there's a million ways why I could be wrong. Like maybe they just don't commit to GitHub or, or maybe they have a second GitHub. Like it doesn't matter. Like, of course, people just glorify the whole thing. But I think the point I was driving home is that at Tensor, we're looking for, for people for whom it's a craft. They're passionate about it way beyond the, here's the objective we need you to fulfill. It's like the current engineer we have, the reason he's magical is because we tell him like, hey, could you do A? He comes back to us and he says, guys, I did A, but in the process, I discovered B and C and D, which I thought about and I tinkered with and I want to tell you about. And that's magical because if you have 20 of those guys on the team, then all of a sudden, the best ideas are not bottlenecked into the founders. And all of a sudden, they can emerge from any part of the business. And that's how you scale into something as awesome and, and big as Amazon or Facebook or Google, where each individual contributor is an idea center. 
right? Well, at the same time, at the same time, performing performing work. And so, like the the advice for like how do you build a startup? I mean, there's no single advice. What's your life situation? Where do you live? How much money do you need to survive? Ultimately, the one thing I sort of believe in is that the younger you are, the more time you should be spending on this because it costs you less. You don't have other people who depend on you. You don't have other real responsibilities you need to take care of. As you become older, you maybe have kids, you have you know family that you, you should be spending time with. Uh, it's just harder. You can't be you can't be sleeping on a bin bag in the office anymore. You know, like you have to you have to spend time with your family. And so, yeah, there's no easy answer. But I think that those are some of the thoughts. For those who don't know, Tinser's slogan. I don't know if you guys call this a slogan. Two devs, two trucks, of coffee, two two hours of sleep, and, and wild dreams. So I think that that fits your description pretty well. If if you did have a bigger team, and I know you have the resources, and you've you've kept basically the funding trim for a reason is it like really gives you focus but what what do you think either your protocol is missing or something in salon is missing that you'd like for someone to build and maybe something you would do yourself if you did have that time that's a good question i think for us at least speaking from sort of a, a layman's perspective outside of like nft outside of the nft space like i know nothing about what's going on in DeFi. i don't know anything about what's going on in dow technology or l2s or you know whatever l1s are coming out i think outside of that and and just focusing on solana or focusing on everything that i know about solana i think one thing that is sorely missing in this ecosystem are apps that consumers or retail people want to use outside of just speculation. I think it's hard because creating a good consumer app is like very difficult. If you think about like all the Web2 consumer apps you use daily, that you use um, like maybe once a week, maybe once every single day, depending on what it is. Like there are only a handful that I can name off the top of my um, head that I would personally use in Web2. And now if you think about like Web3, where a lot of the focus is on, like there's this shiny object, which is called speculation. There's this shiny object that is called trading. If you come, if you sort of like position that against like building a, a fun speculation app, a fun trading app that, you know, generates you a bunch of fees towards building some like consumer app that is not very well defined in terms of like, what is it going to accomplish that's different from Web2? Like that's pretty difficult. That being said, I think, People exploring ideas when it comes to building essentially fun consumer apps, I think that needs to happen more often, especially in Sol on Solana. And I think there are teams that are tackling this that are using, for example, compressed NFTs to try try uh, exploring new ideas since you're no longer inhibited by technology or the cost of the blockchain. Garrett, do you um, do you have anything else, or I'm going to do some rapid fire? Let's do the rapid fire. All right, so. Disclaimer, I make everything up on the spot here, and I will just ask random questions. Try to keep the answers relatively short, but, I mean, if, if you think it makes sense to expand on it, of course, go ahead. Um, and then I'll just go Ilya and then Richard for every single question so we can kind of get both your takes. Cool? All right. So uh, let's start. Let's see. How do you describe Tensor to your parents? It's a platform where you can buy and say, sell pixelated uh, pictures of animals for large amounts of money, mainly for a loss. <laughs> they must think you're crazy, man. I love it. They think I'm unemployed, <laughs> I guess. Where's the line? Yeah, so my parents are like pretty big into luxury goods. So I just tell them like, this is the new way to buy and sell luxury goods but it's like entirely digital. So you don't even have to like go to the store. Hmm. What is the worst possible take you've ever seen on NFTs before? That you just vehemently disagree with? It's probably people who say that NFTs shouldn't be financialized. And the reason I think that's short-sighted is because there's a very clear trend in the economy of anything that has value becoming more financialized. And saying that this whole, basically 50% of the economy that just happens to be non-fungible shouldn't be financialized, I think makes zero sense to me. I guess for me, it's like very similar. 
Um, I think like one of the biggest things that came up during the AMM stuff is like people said liquidity is bad for NFTs because it somehow makes the price goes down. But if you like, if you're from finance or if you have like a quant background, you know that it goes both ways. Like liquidity, like it doesn't have a bias towards the price going down or the price going up. So I think that's like completely, you know, to put it lightly, like horseshit. <laughs> so you're referring to like the blur chilled NFTs narrative essentially there. Um, okay. Uh, describe your co-founder in one word. Too smart. That's two words. Sorry, but it's what it is. Uh, I never have to check Richard's code because I basically assume that whatever he wrote is going to be more carefully prepared and, and like more accurate than like me reading of it and like trying to find like things in there, even though I, I always try and sometimes I leave like a little comment. For me, it's driven or ambitious. I think Ilya, like out of everyone that I've met, whether I was looking for a startup like co-founder or it was some colleague that I had at a previous workplace, like he's probably one of the most laser focused individual when it comes to building a, a, a big company, when it comes to building an awesome product. Nice. If you could steal one personality trait from anybody in history, you know, Leonardo da Vinci's drawing skills, Steve Jobs marketing, who would it be from and why? I would pick clarity of thought. Probably Steve Jobs, maybe Elon Musk, but like pick your favorite, you know, person who thought about the world very, very clearly from first principles, unaffected by the short term emotions, FOMO, and all of that. Ultimately, like, one thing I learned when I moved from banking into product is that the quality of your decisions actually matters more than how many of those decisions you make or how fast you can execute on them. Because if you make the right decision, and even if you're moving at 20% of the speed of your competitor, you'll still end up ahead if they make the wrong one. And so like being able to think clearly about the world and just see things for what they are and make the most objective decisions, I think is the single most important superpower. I, I guess just like in general, like personality trait wise, I think for me, it's being, being able to be, it's kind of like similar to clarity of thought, but being like downright, like super intellectually honest with yourself and being able to um, like put it straight to people i think that's like and being able to put it straight to people like in a good way so that they don't feel bad they don't feel like they're being unheard i think that's like the quickest way to getting stuff done i think if you can be straight with people in a nice way they'll understand where you're coming from and you don't have to waste time uh trying to make them feel like you know they they have a they have some opportunity with you to work with you to partner with you like frankly like it doesn't make sense i think that's something that i'm trying to learn to do better over time but it's also difficult it's it's a skill that you have to kind of learn over time i've got one more I'll throw in there mm -hmm. um what, what is something today that you think people are missing or they don't talk about that in say five to ten years everyone will look back and say that was obvious and specifically in, in crypto or nfts yeah, maybe the fact that the next wave of products is going to look nothing like the wave before. I feel there's this just strong desire in crypto, especially from people that have already made it, to pattern match on what happened in the past cycle and to just say like, okay, well, the next cycle is going to be the same thing, but 10x bigger. But if you actually look at each cycle, Ethereum was not Bitcoin, but 10x bigger. Ethereum was something else. And I think the next cycle, when we start seeing applications that actually drive it and take off, I don't think they will be a 10x bigger version of things we've seen in 2018 and 19. I think there'll be something completely else. It'll be things that we can't, can't even think about today. And, and by definition, they're going to be unpredictable. And like going back to what we spoke about earlier, like our bet is that compressed NFTs will unlock some of that design space and enable some of the things that right now might seem totally crazy. 
I think for for me, when it comes to NFTs, I think we'll see it essentially be used in almost everything that touches the blockchain. So if you think about just crypto as a whole, any consumer app, any uh, infrastructure, we'll use NFT in some form. But the thing is, like these NFTs won't be traded, and that's fine for us. These NFTs uh, may be soul bound; they might not even move, change hands. But it's such it's a more natural way of encapsulating essentially almost like a almost like a, a backpack or like a like a, a luggage like a crate of stuff that is non fungible you can't you can't commute it with any other object um, and like it, it's hard to imagine what they'll be but I think like it's going to be I mean I don't know if this is like unpredictable but it's it's going to come in all sorts of forms and it's going to be so uh, proliferated that like any, anything we touch will basically be an NFT. And we'll get to the point where somebody calling themselves an NFT marketplace or an NFT project won't make any sense. The same way that calling yourself a dot com today doesn't make any sense. They'll be like, yeah, of course you're an NFT project because it's the superior way to do something. Like it just, just makes sense, right? Interesting. What is your currently most unpopular opinion that you're convinced is correct? that Solana is not going to zero. I mean, we're basically betting the company on it, hate it or love it. To us, it's such a clear bet in terms of the risk reward profile um, versus everything else right now. I honestly don't know what I would be building if if not this on Solana right now. Like I'd probably still find some idea on Solana because I feel that the space on EVM is getting crowded in terms of what you can build that's totally novel. And something like ZK rollups or whatever still needs like another number of years to run before it gets to the point where it's like totally productionized and you can actually unlock even newer design space there. So probably that as boring as it is. Yeah, very similar, I think. But I think just to go even further, I think there will be more daily active users on Solana than any other chain um, because consumer apps in the near term will just be it's it's more obvious for them to be building on Solana than an L2, than on Ethereum mainnet, than on let's say the next L1. It, it's just like Solana right now. I think is in such a good position to capitalize on consumer adoption that I can't see how it could fall behind when it comes to mass user adoption. Even if the user doesn't know anything about Solana, that there's Solana running in the back background, I think there will be more users on Solana just from, from a pure like numbers perspective. Hmm. I think that's uh, I think that's a good place to close. Ilya, Richard, thank you so much for joining. I've uh, as getting as I was getting prepared for this podcast, I was listening to a few of the things you've done in the past and I was just like blown away. I thought I thought that you must have been like five time founders by that point because the wisdom that you talk about with product and distribution and, and so forth is really fascinating. And um, you've done an amazing job with Tensor, so it's super exciting. Uh, we'll definitely put links to the show notes to Tensor and to your profiles. If there's anything else you want to close with, um, you can do that now. But thank you so much for joining. Thanks for having Appreciate us. Appreciate it. Thanks. All right. Thanks, guys. We'll see you next time.